I was on the 436 bus heading into Sydney City once when we stopped at this bus stop and uh, this lady in her mid-50s got onto the bus in this faded floral dress. She paid her fare, she walked up the aisle and ignoring all the empty seats in the bus, she came and sat right down next to me. We carried on down into the city in silence, traveling down there on the bus for a little while. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, Floral Lady did the most extraordinary thing. She turned and looked at me. She thrust her head into my face. She came so close, the hairs on her chin almost tickled me. And out of nowhere, with her brown eyes bulging and her teeth bared, she yelled at me, I'm all right, aren't I? Now, I don't know what you would do in that situation, but I jumped <laughs> and my mind started racing for a reply. And because I couldn't think of anything appropriate to say in the moment, I did what any theologically trained, wholeheartedly devoted disciple of Jesus would do in that situation. I lied. I said, well, of course you're all right. And she said, well, some people think I'm funny in the head. And I said, now, why would they think that? She said she didn't know. And then she went down back into silence. I tried to engage her in further conversation, but no, she was off away in the clouds. We kept on going into Sydney City, me and my friend traveling in silence when suddenly Floral Lady got up out of her seat, crossed the aisle, and ignoring all the empty seats in the bus, she sat down next to the only other person in the bus. And after a few moments of silence, she did it to her. I'm all right, aren't I? You know, I wondered to myself as I was watching this happening, how many times during the rest of the day that question, I'm all right, aren't I, would be asked. And I pondered to myself. I wondered how deep was the anxiety that woman's soul, that she longed for assurance so desperately she would seek it from any stranger on the bus. I'm all right, aren't I? Am I right? Am I acceptable? Am I valuable? We all ask those kinds of questions, particularly when the storms of life hit us. My encounter with Floral Lady happened at a time when my wife Marin and I were experiencing a huge storm of our own. I'll tell you a little bit more about that story later on in the series. But the end result of that was we packed up our bags, we left Sydney, and we changed countries. We flew right across the world to start our lives again. Am I okay? Am I acceptable? Am I valuable? I was asking all those questions and more as we arrived in our new country of England. And that's when I started my experiment. I had read Jesus' famous words in the Sermon on the Mount plenty of times before, but if I'm going to be honest with you, I normally read through it quite briskly. There's a lot of comfort in the Sermon on the Mount. This is where we find Jesus saying that the mourning are going to be comforted and those who are poor in spirit are blessed and we don't need to worry about our lives because God cares for us. But if you've read it, you know that it's pretty challenging. It's pretty confronting. As much as we have those kinds of statements, we have statements about loving one's enemies. And it was kind of easy for me to breeze past those difficult bits to get onto the nice bits where, you know, uh, we're told that God gives good gifts to his children. Then one day I decided, I'm going to read the Sermon on the Mount every day for a month. And so that's what I did. Every morning I opened up the sermon and I read it either in whole or in part, slowly, prayerfully, every day for a month. That led on to two months and then on to three, before I knew it, the sermon had gotten a hold of me. And for good reason, in the sermon, I found this guide to the essential aspects of life, our callings, our relationships, our spiritual practices, our choices, from sex to prayer to conflict to possessions. It covers the grittiest of topics without embarrassment or apology. And here's what else I found. The sermon isn't just a guide to the essential aspects of life. It's a guide to the resilient life. Researchers like Martin Seligman have looked into human resilience, and they've found that it's built on a few key factors. Things like positive emotions, being able to amplify things like being optimistic and hopeful and peaceful and joyful and managing negative emotions like bitterness and anger and those kinds of things. Having strong relationships, having good solid marriages and good friendships and good relationships with colleagues and being part of a community. A third factor is accomplishment. 
we weather life storms better if we feel like we're achieving some goals and doing something that matters. And then a fourth factor is meaning. If we feel like our lives are part of something bigger, if we're part of some sort of grand purpose, or maybe if there's a story that can help interpret both the good and the bad aspects of our lives. Now, here's the thing. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus touches all of those factors about what makes a resilient life. And in fact, he ends the sermon with this powerful image. He says, if you don't just listen to what I say, if you put it into practice, you'll be like somebody who builds their life on rock rather than sand. When the storms come, when the rain starts to pelt you, when the floodwaters rise, when the winds beat against you, you won't collapse. The house of your life won't fall to bits. It'll stand. You'll be resilient. Jesus starts his radical sermon with its radical promise of resilience with some pretty radical words. He climbs up the lush, rolling hills just near Lake Galilee there. He sits down in the customary way and begins to teach. His disciples come to him, and so does a big crowd of people from all the surrounding villages that he's already helped and healed. And you can see him getting up there, looking at the crowd, and you can imagine him looking at every face that is there. And he starts to teach saying these words, God blesses the poor and those who recognize their need for him. The kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses the humble. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice. God blesses the merciful. God blesses those whose hearts are pure. God blesses those who work for peace. God blesses the persecuted. These are radical words. In Jesus' day, You were blessed for pretty much the same reasons that we would consider somebody blessed today. You'd be considered blessed if you had a good reputation, a model family, if you found yourself in the right social circles, if you were prosperous, if you were successful. You were blessed if you were popular. You were blessed if you were pretty. You were blessed if you were healthy, talented, influential. Those kinds of people got to hobnob with all the powerful people. Those kinds of people got the invitations to the best parties. Not the poor, not the sad not the persecuted, not the little people with their empty purses and crooked teeth. And yet those are the very people Jesus says, you are blessed. What does all this mean? It means that Jesus ignores the world's popularity lists. His invitation to a resilient life is extended to all the people you'd least expect. Right from the beginning of his sermon, he flings wide the doors to his kingdom and he invites the sick, the sad, the unworthy, the unpretty, the picked on, the beaten up, the socially awkward, the homeless, people like Floral Lady, people like you and me. I'm all right, aren't I? Yeah, we're okay. Our places are ready at his table. Some days we wake to a world of crystal skies and bright possibilities. Other times it's to rain pelting our windows and thunder rattling our roofs. Jesus never says we'll be spared the storms of life. He wasn't. There'll be bruises, maybe even scars. What he does is he invites us to follow him, to learn from him, to enter his kingdom, become a member of God's family. And there we find all the acceptance and the love and the joy and the peace and the calling and the meaning that we need to live a resilient life. So here's something to try. Read the Sermon on the Mount from beginning to end. It's not going to take you long. And then start thinking about or discussing in your groups how what you're reading there in Jesus' teaching will develop a resilient life.